autism spectrum disorder is just, I think it's a name to understand that these kiddos and individuals, their mind works in a slightly different way. Because of that, they have the superpower of seeing our world in a different light at a different angle. It is up to us to help support them to be able to create a space where they can share that viewpoint, that perspective. And not only teach them how to be in this world, but also teach this world how to open up space for an individual like them. Welcome to another episode of Mental Health in the Age of the Metaverse. I'm your host, Christian Ulstrup. My guest today is Dr. Vivian Oberlin. Vivian is a clinical psychologist in Orange County. She works with a wide range of clients, including kids and teens. Vivian also has a foot firmly planted in the technology startup world. She is the founding psychologist at PACE, which is backed by Sequoia and focuses on the power of groups for adult connection in the digital age. Vivian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It's great to have you. Um, So I thought I'd just dive in and and ask, how did you decide to become a clinical psychologist? This was definitely not something that if you had asked me as a young kid, what would you be growing up? Um, this is not what I would have answered. If you had asked me then, I definitely would have said I would have been an astronaut. So we've you know, not really gone down that path. Um, but my story to my career path was I really wanted to be a pediatrician. That was my goal ever since probably age five to 18 or 19. And Then what happened was I went to UCLA, did pre-med, right? Started down that path, started volunteering in a hospital and recognized, oh my God, I don't know one doctor's name here. I work with the patients. I know the nurses. I know the child life specialists, but the people who were actually doing the work I wanted to do, you know, face-to-face with the kiddos, they weren't the doctors in the way, they weren't the doctors in Mm. what I wanted to do. So was feeling a little lost for a while. And then actually a cousin of mine was diagnosed with autism. It was a time for my family of a lot of confusion. We didn't know what was going on for him, why he would get so upset at certain things, why he would bang his head. And he was, after his diagnosis, enrolled in the UCLA partial hospitalization program. And it was just luck that I was able to go to his birthday party at this program, see the work they were doing, seeing the impact it made on my cousin's life and for my family of understanding him, him being able to communicate with us, right? Us understanding him for his strengths and his his quirkiness um, that were his superpowers. (laughs) And that really just opened up the door to psychology and giving me a way to really impact people's lives. That's a very powerful experience. So he went from being in, this was an inpatient program? So it was a partial inpatient program, which means the kiddos came from 8.30 to 2 and Mm -hmm. um, they left. So they did it for about three months and Mm -hmm. it covered every sort of intervention. So academic, social, um, sensory, PT, OT, RT, Mm -hmm. like everything and anything. And it was all individualized. So you only Mm -hmm. had about five kids in each class with a ratio of about three to four teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, It was an amazing thing that I honestly wish could be everywhere for um, all the kiddos that have that diagnosis. I'm sure that that's got to be pretty um, surprising for parents who, who originally get that diagnosis. Confusion, questions about what to do, what does this mean for my kid? Um, you mentioned superpowers mm-hmm. that this is, you know, this is, this is sort of a, he has a, he has superpowers. Um, I think that's a really nice framing. What, what would you say to a parent whose child was, was just diagnosed with autism? I think the first thing I would say is it's okay to be hard and it's okay to grieve. Um, a parent myself, we all have dreams for our kiddos. Uh, and we try to hold them back, right? Trying to make sure that we're actually giving our kiddos rooms to have dreams themselves, but we we want the best for our kids. And I think that's the first thing I would say is it's okay to grieve and mm-hmm. be sad at the loss of those dreams. And then after that, take a moment to build the support network, to 
start to understand and maybe reframe what we think about as strengths and start to just understand for your specific kiddo, what are the things that he or she is really good at? And Mm. also autism spectrum disorder is just, I think it's a name to understand that these kiddos and individuals, their mind works in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they have the superpower of seeing our world in a different light at a different angle. Mm -hmm. And it is up to us to help support them to be able to create a space where they can share that viewpoint, that perspective, um, and not only teach them how to be in this world, but also teach this world how to open up space for an individual like them. What are some examples that come to mind and maybe one in particular where you've seen those superpowers come through? I There's so many. I'm like, they hearing through the years, all the families and kiddos I've worked with. Um, I have one kiddo in mind. I, I knew her when she was really young and she would always she gravitated towards music and one of the things that she would often do and she would do it more when she was nervous is script so she would remember words say them over and over again and she loved the smashing pumpkins so you have a four-year-old who knows the words to every smashing pumpkin song known to man um and who would recite them you know when she got nervous or just when she was in her downtime. Um, But that superpower led to her now being a teenager to be an amazing musician who just finds so much joy singing the songs, playing piano. And I think that is a superpower that can be utilized because oftentimes that's seen as something that we have to stop, you know, stop scripting, stop saying those things repetitively. Um, But for her, she had an amazing mom who utilize that skill and to something like, okay, you love the Smashing Pumpkin? Let's get you into music class. Let's have you learn to sing those things and then perform it and get joy from it. And so it's all that reframing and just really showing off that power. That's great. A reframing, seems mm-hmm. that seems like a key step, right? So thinking of it exactly. as, as something that um, can allow you to be creative and, and flourish in that way. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So you've been in clinical practice for a while. Um, and, uh, uh, I guess maybe a year and a half, two years ago now you, you took, took a dive into the startup world, uh, over at Pace. Um, you guys are doing some, some really, I think, uh, cutting edge and, um, leading stuff in kind of the mental health tech space, which is sort of, sort of a hot thing. Um, how did you decide to, to do that? I have a smile on my face because I definitely came in with the opposite mindset. So it was very serendipitous in meeting one of the founders at Pace. Um, And when I was talking to Kat Lee, I really walked into that meeting being like, all right, I'm going to tell her everything they're doing wrong. I'm going to, you know... (laughs) And use this opportunity to really say, hey, you can't just take everything from psych like CBT, put it in an app and say, we've recreated psych and tech. Um, This is the future. But what I think really shifted my mindset was talking to Kat and hearing her story about why she started Pace, why it was so important to create a space in the digital age where people could connect and kind of reclaim some of that loss sense of community um, that I think is missing in the world right now. And not only did she want to do that as a service to the world, but also that it was something she personally was yearning for at certain parts in her life. And that really just connected with me. Um, I think we all have that time where we're looking for something, looking for a space to just be honest with people, honest with ourselves. And that can be hard to do uh, with friend groups or family, right? We all have patterns, ways of being with people. And this was a space to do something different. And I think it was that that hopefulness, that passion of, 
wow, this is something we could build that doesn't exist yet, that we can take learnings um, that I've had growing in as a psychologist of, God, I wish we could do this or this, but I can't do that because of bureaucracy or red tape, whatever it is, um, or just like the culture of, no, that's not something we do. And that's, I think that's what really made me kind of jump into this space because there's a lot of things that we can build here and a little bit of the wild, wild west in terms of, wow, like there's not, there's not much we can't do. Um, so it, that's really why I took the dive. And I think I will add a caveat to that. Um, when I said wild, wild west, I think I gave myself anxiety a little bit as a <laughs> clinical psychologist. But I think that was also one of the things that made me jump in the space was because the founders are really intentional about what they're doing as am I in building this company where we want to make sure it's also very clear of what we are, that it's ethical, that it's really coming from a human priority of mm -hmm. we want to make sure we are doing the best for our members. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, that really resonates. Um, I think uh, in, in sort of, you know, personally, professionally, I found a lot of mental health professionals are understandably pretty skeptical of kind of the, the tech industry. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, sort, sort of just like in your case, there's the question of, okay, are you going to try to automate what I'm doing or, you know, turn it into software or remove the human element, right? Mm -hmm. Which is absolutely crucial. Um, I mean, in life, but like certainly when it comes to, you know, facilitating wellness, uh, better, better mental health, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so, so to that end, for those folks in the audience who are mental health professionals who are interested in what's going on in the technology world and are a little bit curious, but are kind of skeptical, um, what, what would you say to them? I would say bring that skepticism in um, and maybe kind of look at it as curiosity. That, that is one thing that I have grown to appreciate about the tech space and the startup world is almost everyone I've met is genuinely curious. They welcome the questions. They welcome the skepticism of, wait, wh why do you think that? Tell me more. Like, I want to hear it. So don't hold back from those questions. Like, talk to people. And if it's something you're interested in, do the cold call reach out. Find someone on LinkedIn. You're like, huh, they're interesting. Let me just reach out and see if they're willing to talk. So many times um, people have been so open about, sure, I'll grab a like virtual 15 minute coffee with you, chat a little bit, right? Answer questions, build those connections. Um, so don't be afraid to just test it out. And if you're cur curious about it, lean into that curiosity. And on the flip side of the equation, those yeah. mental health tech founders or maybe uh, <laughs> you know, folks who are curious about collaborating with um, with uh, licensed professionals in this in this wild west space where there's a lot of opportunity to do new things, um, what what would you what would you say to them uh, before they embark on their journey? I would say, you know, utilize the expertise that it's out in the community already. Um, there's so many people who are in the mental health space who have been doing this for decades and. They have such, so much wealth of knowledge um, that, you know, really lean into that, get people's opinions um, as you jump into it. And like I said, while there are things that are culturally kind of bounded in the world of mental health, uh, that it's good for us to question, at the same time, there are a lot of things that are in place for the safety and benefit of people. And talking to mental health uh, clinicians, you can start to get a sense of where are the places that we can push, innovate, and where are the places we want to hold true to because it's keeping people safe and it's honoring the dignity of humans. Got to put the human at the center, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Pace, is, Pace has grown quite substantially. I think, I, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, you've now taken investment from, from Sequoia. Um, I think now global as well. Is that right? Yep. So we do have global members now and um, we just had our two-year birthday actually. In, Congratulations. In June. Thank you. 
Very exciting. Um, what have you personally been surprised by on this journey? Oh my God, I'm like pausing because there's so many things <laughs> I've been surprised by. Which one to choose from? Um, I think it's one of the things I think I've been surprised by both in terms of our pace groups and the internal team working is how easy it's been to kind of move over to a virtual environment. Um, mm. I think while I truly believed in this, there was always that little question in the back of my mind of like, can this actually truly transfer? Can I have this connection with people that I've never met that I only see on my screen? Mm. And I can 100% say yes. I have deeper connections with people in my pace groups, with people I've worked with than a lot of people I've met in real life. And it is just learning a new way of talking and being, right? Like of understanding. I talk a little bit more with my hands. Um, I notice people's facial expressions a little more because that's what I'm looking at primarily. But it's it's just a new way of communicating and it can just be, it can be as deep and profound as a relationship in person. Just to kind of switch gears a little bit there, technology and youth mental health. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a topic that, you know, we, we dig into quite a bit. We have parents in the audience who care about this. Um, there's, there's been discussion a lot recently around social media, which is uh, almost, almost kind of a, a misnomer in my opinion, because they are, you know, digitally mediated social experiences, but it's not the same as being in a pace group, right? Yep. Um, so uh, Jonathan Haidt, for example, uh, he's, he's um, done quite a bit of work around the impact of social media on mental health, especially when it comes to adolescents and, and girls in particular, um, I believe. Um, you know, as a clinical psychologist, as a mom, as, as somebody who's, you know, part of this founding team at Pace, um, what do you think about the role of social media in youth mental health in 2022? It's a big question. Um, and I think at the crux of it, I really truly believe that social media is a tool and that it's not inherently good or bad. It really is dependent on how we, the individual, the parent, society, how we utilize it. So I think it the first thing that comes to mind is two experiences I've had as a clinical psychologist with clients where social media had a huge impact on my patients, both in a negative way and a positive way. And I mean, one that comes to mind is I had a teenager, super sweet kid. Um, he was so, you know, full of life, but also dealt with a lot of anxiety. And I remember him coming in one day for a session and his face was just so sad. And he had gotten a haircut that he was so excited about. And because of this excitement, he wanted to share it with his peers. And we talked about this later, but, you know, let's, let's think about where we share this. But he utilized Snapchat and he just wanted to just share his joy. And he put a picture of his new haircut on there. And it just got bombarded with comments. And unfortunately, the negative comments outweighed the positive because the way he was utilizing Snapchat, the way his friends at school were utilizing Snapchat was to send it to a big group at their public high school. So it was like yeah. open up to everyone at that school. So you just had people who felt the need to share things that weren't productive and that impacted his you know, self-confidence, how he saw it, something that was so exciting for him, so joyful, quickly became something that triggered a lot of questions about I'm good enough, right? Um, mm -hmm. What does this say about me? And so we worked through, you know, how to share that joy, how to protect himself, and how to also use strategies to cut out the noise um, and see what actually was useful for him. So that was an example where not great impact. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, I had a lot of patients who really utilized it and utilized it in their treatment. Um, I had an eight-year-old who I was seeing for alopecia. 
and that is uh, for hair loss. So she had lost her eyebrows already, was starting to lose the hair on her head. And this was something she wasn't sure how to start sharing it with her classmates in school because it was becoming noticeable. So she loved YouTube, followed a YouTuber that was like her favorite thing to do, right? Any reward was, I want to watch um, some YouTube. And so we created a YouTube episode. She got to be the host. She got to um, explain what alopecia was. She got to explain how it's actually really cool. She gets to choose different wigs, how she can't control certain things, right? All the research we did together, she got to be the host and share this as an expert. And then we got to share that YouTube episode to her classmates and her classmates loved it. They did in class, they watched Mm -hmm. her YouTube video. So they shared it with the school. And what came out of that was she felt so empowered by that um, experience. She made more. She started making other episodes for other kids who just got their diagnosis of alopecia. And she got to show things like the first time she went somewhere without her wig um, and Mm -hmm. how she was scared, but how then people actually embraced it uh so she she used social media in a way that really not only helped her own self-worth and empowerment but then they passed it on to other kids who were in similar situations and other kids that could be you know 10 states away not someone that Mm -hmm. she knew in her support group Um, Mm -hmm. so i think it's just those two examples come to mind for me with that question that's extremely interesting. So it's like, I, um, I talked to somebody last week who highlighted a study, I'm forgetting where it came from, but there was a recent study that showed that cyberbullying usually actually happens within the local offline group. And that ca- kind of like what you're saying in the case of the second girl, this actually went beyond even her pre-existing social network and she was able to do good at a scale that maybe wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Mm-hmm. And that this seems, this seems to be kind of a common pattern, which is sort of counterintuitive that actually when things go right on social media or through you know, social digital experiences, um, it, it really is about connecting with those folks beyond your, your immediate social circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it's almost like yeah. a numbers game, right? The more people yeah. you reach, the, the wider the net of just catching... I don't want to say the good people, but the people who can lift you up, right? Right. And it's just helping our kids cut off the noise to get to those people that are yeah. worth hearing from. Yeah. We need the we need like a, a vibe filter on Twitter or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. No vibe. Sorry, you don't make it through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I mean in the, in those terms, let's say, let's say um you are the parent of a kid who's you know, using Snapchat or using one of these platforms and uh, has just heard what we talked about where, you know, they, they'd be concerned that um, maybe they would catch flack from classmates or mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is, but they want them to use social media in a healthy way. What can, what can parents do to help facilitate a healthier relationship so that, you know, maybe your kid ends up doing something great for all these people outside of their community? Like in the second example, I think that's, that's like a very admirable um, thing to, to shoot for. I think one of the first things I would tell parents is start to have these conversations with your kids now. Um, mm. It's never too early and it's never too late. Start having discussions about what social media um, brings to your kiddo's life. In other words, you know, don't start off with, uh, okay, I have to restrict. You can't do this, this, and this. Let, let's be honest, especially you know, with preteens and teens, you're going to get a... <laughs> A blank face and you know in their head they're saying i'm going to do this after mom turns around or dad turns around uh but kind of open it up to a conversation about what what are you getting from this you know what brings you joy from this is it talking to people is it meeting new people is it working as a distraction for you is it just like giving you new information what is the benefit and the function of social media for your kiddos And I would not be surprised as you start to have that conversation, they also may not really know what the function of social media is for them. And I think that's really important to start teaching them to look at and be able to assess. Mm -hmm. I know adults that can't do it really well, and it's really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Um, But having that discussion 
then allows you as a parent to think about, okay, if my teen is looking for social connection through social media, how do I help them get that in a way that's healthy? And how do I then start to parse out when that's not what's happening? Mm-hmm. So for this kiddo, in that example, it was looking for community support. It was looking for people that could help validate um, when he was feeling good about himself. And because that was a function of it, we talked about, well, if we do that in this big of an atmosphere, right, there's a probability you're going to get people who tell you things you don't want to hear. And do you actually care about, you know, Johnny from 12th grade math that you haven't seen in four years? No, you don't care about him. So why would you want to share that with him? Who do you want to share with that you know that will kind of provide what you're looking for? So you can start to make those little adjustments um, in how they're using social media and it becomes a collaborative process versus a restriction and setting limits that um, your teens or kids aren't a part of building with you. And when they don't build it with you, it's very likely they're not going to follow it either. Right. Right. Yeah. So making it really collaborative. I think that's a, that's a quite a profound point actually, because we, that question of why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. I don't think for adults gets asked enough, let alone kids. Right. And unfortunately, a lot of these products are designed such that you find yourself in it without necessarily having a goal in the first place. Yep. And so I think that's um, that's a great point that simply asking the question of what what am I hoping to get out of this? What am I hoping to create? You know, what what value uh, can emerge from an interaction that I'm having between other people, or you know, through consuming content or creating it? Um, it's definitely a, a, a question and a conversation I think that should be happening a lot more often. Yeah, and I fully admit there are times when I know, oh, I'm scrolling through Instagram today purely because I want to distract myself and I want to do something mindless. And Mm -hmm. that's totally fine as well. But it's also really beneficial for me to know that I'm doing that because with that knowledge, I'm also able to kind of track, all right, I've been doing this for like 20 minutes. Maybe I should go do something else now. Um, Versus when, at least personally, when I don't have an understanding of why I'm doing something, I sit Mm -hmm. in it for longer. And then Mm -hmm. it does start that cycle of, why was I doing this for so long? Right now, I I wasted time that I could have done to finish this. And it just starts like guilt cycle um, that just Mm -hmm. doesn't put me in a good place. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So for, let's say, parents who... Uh, have have gone gone down that sort of like guilt shame spiral before they found themselves, you know, zoning out on Instagram on the couch yeah. for a couple of hours some evening. What what's a first step that they can take to cultivate their own healthier tech habits? I think probably the first step is just recognizing it, um, and then asking that question: Why? Why am I zoning out on this? Mm-hmm. And then the hard part is not judging yourself for it. Um, Give yourself Mm -hmm. that compassion of, eh, we all do that, right? Um, And then I think the next step is really thinking about, okay, is this in line with what I value and what I want to do with my time? And there's days that that might be true. And then there's other days where if the answer is no, thinking about what else in terms of actions, activities are more value aligned with what I'm looking for. and being able to do that yourself as a parent, practicing that, modeling that, showing, oh, I mess up too in this process is really powerful for your kids in the long run because they have a good example of how to interact with these tools in a way that they can continue to apply as technology changes um, because it's not going to remain the same. But mm-hmm. that core question of why am I doing this, mm-hmm. that will always be beneficial. Yeah. And you mentioned modeling. I mean, kids learn everything else from their parents, right? So having, okay. having that, so it sounds like having a process in place where you're asking the why question, but then there's kind of another level to that, which that assumes that you've, you kind of have a why <laughs> in, in the sure. first place. And that, that can be a, that can be a sort of its own arduous journey, right? 
Yeah. And, you know, this is where if you find yourself either personally or with your kid's journey of asking why you're at a loss, that's where support comes in, whether that is family, friends, um, plug pace a little bit, a pace group for other uh, minds and perspectives, but also coaches, right? Therapists, Mm -hmm. um, clinicians. If you feel like you need someone outside of the situation to help provide others perspectives and strategies, definitely go utilize those supports. Uh, They can be really helpful in just starting to answer that question and putting into place other habits that are healthier. Excellent. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Exactly. What is a topic that you think is not getting enough attention when it comes to, let's say, mental health generally, but perhaps even in, in this this wild west world that you're seeing firsthand? So many things. I'm like literally thinking about it. Like one of the things that comes out that's not getting as much attention. And I think this has been, you know, in the news and media a bit more is I think it's hard for many people, especially our teens and our um, young kiddos, to have an honest discussion um, with people of different backgrounds, opinions, ideologies. And I think it is one of those things that has shifted in how people cope with it. Um, I was thinking about this earlier today, and I think technology has made our world smaller in ways that are really beneficial um, and in ways that can be difficult. And with that, as things get smaller, feel people feel the need to just, I think, spew out their ideas or opinions very quickly. And mm-hmm. it's harder to sit and have a conversation and be open to different perspectives. Um, and I think the reason I'm talking about that is that kids often take the things they hear out there instead of thinking about, okay, well, do I agree with that? How do I have a conversation? How do I be curious about why that person thinks that way? And mm-hmm. they almost take it as fact and they kind of just absorb it all in. And how do, I think it's just pausing and thinking about, okay, how do we open this up to a bigger discussion versus everything being a small soundbite of truth? It's not even Mm -hmm. an opinion anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not like a discussion starter. It's just people are saying, this is the truth, not even my truth. This is the truth for everyone. And as a young kid and adolescent, having so many truths, right, tossed at you in all directions as you try to absorb mm-hmm. it is so confusing. And it can just heighten anxiety, can heighten feelings of hopelessness, which then can lead to a depressive episode, right? And I think it's just pausing and us thinking a little bit more about how do we help our teens and our young kids have the space to have discussions and curiosity. I, I totally agree. I think uh, I think that's a, a very important point is, you know, right now, a lot of these platforms have evolved in such a way that because it's about advertising and grabbing your attention, everything has become bite-sized. Everything has become sort of atomized, compressed, and like engineered into something that's going to grab you and hook you. And those are those simple stories, right? Like what is, what is kind of the simplest story that I can compress something into that's going to be visceral or emotionally compelling. But the truth is, I mean, I, I think right now a lot of um, a lot of those issues that that are very divisive, um, part of the reason why is they are complex and they require a high degree of trust and uh, focused attention and discourse and you know deep thinking and processing that you're, you're definitely not going to get in a tweet. <laughs> or an exchange on, on Twitter, right? And more, more likely to get it in something like Pace, where you're focused for you know 90 minutes with a group. Um, so it's very interesting. And so for, I can understand too, as, as, a, as a kid, if you're hearing 
wildly contradictory but very compelling uh you know points that that could that could feel like you don't have a solid foundation to stand on so if you're if you're 13 and you're feeling really confused because you're getting uh you know these these stories or these signals sent to you from from different um different places that are telling you that the other person's wrong what what's something that you can do to just start processing that in a healthy way I think it's starting to expand. I will, honestly, one of the first things I will teach is just the kids to just question, "Mm, is that really true? (laughs) Just Mm -hmm. take a pause Mm -hmm. and look at the data. Is that really true? And is that true for everyone? And I think an expansion of that is knowing that it doesn't have to be true for me as a person. Um, and I think it's having compassion for other people's differences. And a caveat to all of this is I definitely think there are certain things that, you know, it's okay to be like, mm, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> like not everything has to be a discussion and curiosity, but I think we need a little bit more of that. Uh, but for our kids, I think it's just helping them understand everything they see in social media, um, and all these different places they're getting information that it doesn't necessarily have to be true for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, that there is still a path for them to build their own opinions. So gather information, hear from different people. And I think that's one of the greatest tools is helping our kids hear different perspectives, um, to know that there's always there always is someone that has a different viewpoint and that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, so creating that space where there's more curiosity about things versus, oh, I heard that, you know, the next trend is crop tops, which I'm just, I can't believe the nineties are back. I feel so old <laughs> saying that, but <laughs> that, you know, like that crop tops are the best thing. So I have to wear a crop top versus right. do I even want to wear a crop top? Uh, right. Yes or no, I'm not comfortable in it, whatever it is. And that seems like a silly example, but it's just one of the many things and many messages our kids and teens are getting. It's just helping them pause and question it and be curious about it can be really, really powerful. So, you know, a combination of critical thinking skills, taking a second to pause, and also being okay with not getting swept up into whatever the the latest thing is, right? Yeah. And that's a lot easier said than done. Um, you know, yeah. when kids are with friends, they want to have that sense of community. I will also say parents have to be involved in this because our kids are still building up their executive functioning skills. All those uh, front lobe functions of learning how to hold all these things, question it, right? They're still building up the capacity to do that in a way an adult would. So they do need support um, and guidance in doing that. Awesome. So it's a collaborative yeah. whole whole family kind of got to take that integral approach. Well, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, before we before we part ways, I want to make sure that everyone can connect with you online. So it's a great way to have a positive uh, digital interaction is, is uh, connecting with Dr. Oberling. So you're primarily on LinkedIn. Is that right? Exactly. So you can find me um, just at Vivian Oberling on LinkedIn. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll put that link in the show notes. And then you're also on Instagram. Yes. So my, oh, wow. This is really bad given that I am in the tech space. My handle? Is it? No. <laughs> I forget what the yeah. Instagram. Um, but it's Dr. Vivian Overling on Instagram. And then uh, you can also find me on our Pace Instagram. So pace.groups, plural, uh, is where you'll find us there. And if you're an adult and you're interested in, in having meaningful, fulfilling, uh, you know, rewarding connections with other adults now from around the world, um, you can sign up for a PACE group at pace.group. Um, so we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes. Very excited about what you guys are building. Um, excellent growth. And I think, uh, I think much needed, but also something that um, gives me personally and I think a lot of other people optimism uh, around the power of technology if you know kind of designed in the right way um, to help help us flourish as humans you know yeah. so it's uh, it's uh, that's a great thing um, so Vivian thank you so much for joining me 
Thanks for having me. I've had a blast. Awesome. We'll do this again soon.